presentation is one that I'm really excited about, but I'm honestly slightly nervous about it because we're going to cover quite a little bit of information, and the information is going to require you to be focused and attentive. Can you pull that off for the next sort of 55 minutes, something like that? Okay, so I need you to be in the zone. And uh, because we're going to be talking about some things that are fairly sophisticated, though we'll make sure to explain it in a way that we all can hopefully understand it. But we're also going to talk about something that might be new to many of you. And I know that I'm going out on a bit of a limb when I say that, because there's many of you in this uh, place that have probably been believers longer than I have been. Um, but I want to introduce to you an idea tonight that I think for some of you will be kind of a new concept, a new idea, a new biblical truth. And so with that in mind, I'm just going to have a short little prayer for us, and then we're going to dive right in. Father in heaven, tonight we're asking the question, how do we know that you are there? How do we know that God exists? And I'm praying tonight for clarity and that you will send your spirit into this room and into the hearts of the people that are here to reveal to us this, this great truth um, of your existence, but not only your existence, your tremendous love for us as we learned in our last presentation. So be with us now as we spend some time together thinking and studying in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to go right to the screen here, and we're asking the question, does God exist? In our last presentation, we spent quite a little bit of time taking a look at the question, who is God, as contrasted with the question, what is God? And we sort of said, what God is and his essential nature, we don't really know. But Scripture does spend a lot of time telling us who he is. We certainly know some things about his nature. We throw these words omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, eternal, spiritual, etc. But scripture spends most of the time revealing to us not about God's nature as such, but about his character, the kind of God that he is. And uh, in that little three-word phrase, God is love, we encounter a profound statement not just about his character, which it is, but also about his very nature. And uh, time doesn't allow me to go into that in too much detail, but I will just say briefly that one of the reasons that Christians have historically affirmed the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit configuration of God, that God is triune, and the word that is sometimes used for this is the Trinity, which just means the three divine beings, the three divinity, um, is, is this idea that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as a kind of divine society and uh, even a better word would be as a kind of divine family, uh, as a plurality, God is able to, meet, to be more than merely loving, but to actually be in his very nature, love. And uh, the reason for that is, is that within the very Godhead itself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the heart of the Father would always have been eternally going out to the Son and the Spirit. Well, it's also true that the heart of the Son would have always been going out to the Father and the Spirit, and so too, the heart of the Spirit was always going out to the Father and the Son. And so that in this relationality, in this plurality, in this mutuality, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, this idea that God is not a rigid singularity, but actually a divine society or a divine family makes so much, uh, makes John's saying that God is love so powerful and so profound. And uh, it's, it's not, it shouldn't come as a surprise to us then when God uh, makes something in his image in Genesis 1 and 2, the thing that he makes in his image is not males or females as such. The thing that God makes in his image is a family. He makes a male, he makes a female, a man and a woman, and the very first thing he says to them is be fruitful and multiply. In other words, make another. And so in a very real and profound sense, the thing that is most fully in the image of God is not single males or single females, it's a family. God as a family makes a family in his image. And no wonder then when we come to the New Testament, we find Jesus praying and his disciples overhear him praying and they come to Jesus and they say, man, we love the way you pray. There's a beauty in the way you pray. Unlike the Pharisees and the scribes who pray with such a formality and a ceremonial detachment, uh, ah, we don't even understand what it's about. We like the way you pray. Teach us how to pray. This is in Luke chapter 11. And what Jesus says is profound. He says, okay, pray like this. You want to pray like I pray? You want to have that connection with God? Pray like this. Our Father. And all throughout Scripture, both Old and New Testament, you have this familial language. The thing is wrapped in the language of family. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons or the children of God. 
Right? This idea, John chapter 1, verse 12, to as many as received him, Jesus, to them he gave the right to be called the sons or the children of God. And so you have this familial language just wrapped throughout the Old and the New Testaments. And the reason is that, that God in his very nature is actually relational. He is mutual. He is plural. God as a family makes a family in his image. And of this God, this plural God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, John could look and say not merely God is loving. Oh, no, 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 no. He could say God in his very nature, God in his very character, in the essence of what makes God God, is love. God is more than merely loving as a characteristic or a behavior. God is love in his essential nature. And that's all fine and beautiful and awesome. And that's the first thing that we put on the table of truth. God is love. Um, but that sort of raises the question, is it true? I mean, it's a nice story, and in the first two presentations, I've, I've asked you to admit with me that even if you didn't believe it, you'd have to appreciate the story just on aesthetic grounds. It's a beautiful story. But that kind of raises the question, is this just all pie in the sky by and by? Is it just something that religious peoples, and this is the charge that many, you know, atheists or irreligious peoples levy against Christians and others, and that's just that, oh, you can't get through the difficulties and vicissitudes of life without some God or some sense that someone's looking out for you, so you need a crutch, right? Is that what this is? Is it just a crutch that weak-minded people need in order to get them through the ups and downs of life, particularly the downs? Or are there good reasons to think that there really is a God out there? Right? Is God like the Easter Bunny? Is he like Santa Claus? Is he like the, the, the Tooth Fairy? Or is there good reasons for believing that God exists? Some people are absolutely persuaded in the three configurations that we've talked about of thinking about God that there is no God. We talked about atheism, which is what you have uh, sort of modeled for you here, that there is only matter and energy and that's it. There's no room for a God and no need for a God. We talked about monism, where the universe and God are one. And then we talked also about theism, where God has made the universe, where he is distinct and separate from it, but he made it. But some people are absolutely persuaded that, in fact, there is no God. And uh, even right now, uh, you would say that there is a... It would be totally fair to say that there is a new atheism that is sort of on the rise. It's... Uh, uh, these people are sometimes called the new atheists, the Christopher Hitchens and the Richard Dawkins and the Daniel Dennett's and the Sam Harris's of the world, are not merely content to believe that there is no God, but they are really f very committed to you believing that there is no God. And so among other things, they've written a number of books, they've debated a number of theists, they've even taken out little signs on the buses in uh, London, and uh, I just get a kick out of the signs. Um, they said... There probably is no God, so just enjoy your life, right? And they're very careful. They're very careful to say there probably is no God because they're well aware that no one can say for certain that there is no God. So they say it's unlikely. And I saw a really interesting interview with Richard Dawkins on one occasion when they were asking him, okay, so you say there probably is no God. Like what percentage? Like what, is it like, are you like 51% sure? Because that would be probably. Or he's like, no, no, it would be much higher than that. And he's like, okay, so like, like 90%? No, probably even higher than that. Like, how would you even go about quantifying that? We are 96.3% certain that there is no God, right? But what I want to try and present to you tonight is that, in fact, Dawkins, Hitchens, Harris, and others are mistaken. And uh, the very best evidence points to the fact that there is a God, but I want to try, if possible, to go beyond merely presenting ideas or arguments. I want to try and give you a way that you can know for certain that there is a God. Now, that might sound kind of new to some of you. Like, how can you... You mean, like, for certain, for certain? Like, like for sure I can know? And, uh, yeah, the answer is yes. Let me ask you this question. Let me just start by asking you a question. How many of you believe that God exists? Raise your hand. You believe that God exists. Okay, well, that's almost all of you. Okay. Um, I think it might have been all of you. Now, let me ask this question. It's a little different. How many of you know that God exists? Yeah, the not, not every hand is going up, but still most. They're like, well, well what? I didn't you already ask that? No, listen again. How many of you, what was the first question? How many of you believe that God exists? And the second question was, how many of you? Yeah. Is there a di difference between belief and knowledge? 
Yes, yeah, certainly there is. And I uh, speak to young people and, and not so young people all over the world. And I love to ask this question. How many of you believe that there's a God shoo, 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 in churches all over the world? I've seen hands go up. But then when I ask the second question, how many of you know for certain? Yeah, mm, 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 you're a little bit like Richard Dawkins. There probably is a God, right? You're not quite Sure. So that sort of raises a question for us, doesn't it? I mean, are we just supposed to go on the mass of evidence? Like we're supposed to be 96% or 92% or maybe 89%? How would we go about knowing? I'd like to suggest to you tonight that the answer is yes, God does exist. And though this cannot be proved in the mathematical sense, I cannot prove to your satisfaction that there is a God, I still am going to claim tonight that it can, however, be known for certain. Now, some of you might be saying, well, that's impossible. How, how could you say that you can't prove it, but you can know it? And the answer is this. There are a great many things that you know to be true in your own experience, but which you can never prove to somebody else's absolute satisfaction. For example, how many of you like chocolate chip cookies? <laughs> some of you are like, do I have to admit this? I know this is a religious meeting, but am I being asked to confess? Okay, let's make it something even easier. How many of you like f bananas? That's an easy one. Okay, bananas. Most of people like bananas. Um, now, let me ask you this question. Are you sure that you like bananas? Like, do you just believe that you like bananas or do you know it? Okay, now let's just say that I don't believe you. Let's say that I'm a banana skeptic, right? <laughs> and you are a banana evangelist, otherwise known as a banana, a banana, a banangelist or something like that. <laughs> You're a banana evangelist, and I'm a skeptic, and you say, I really like bananas, and you should like bananas too. And I say, you don't really like bananas. In fact, nobody likes bananas. I am a banana skeptic. And you would say, no, of course, I love bananas. I absolutely love bananas. Now, here's my question for you. Could you do anything to prove to me that you like bananas? Uh, people always say yes. Actually, you're wrong. You can't. But, but let's just pretend for a moment that you could. What could you possibly do to prove to somebody who insisted on skepticism that you like bananas? What could you do? Oh, you could eat some, but all I would say in my skeptical mindset is you're only eating those to try and persuade me that you like bananas. But you don't really. Right? Let me just, let me just make this really easy for you. You couldn't prove it. It would be totally impossible for you to prove to me in the mathematical or the physical sense that you like, that you really do like bananas. Because if I insisted on skepticism, I could say, you're not, you don't really like them. You're only trying to convince me that you like them. When you put that in your mouth, I believe that it tastes bad to you. And you're just trying to convince me that it actually tastes good. Now, here's an interesting thing. Some of you are sitting there saying, well, well wait a minute. I know I like the banana. And that's the point. See, something that you know intuitively, something that you know internally, you cannot prove to someone else's satisfaction because this is something that's happening in your own experience. We together, everyone? Let me use another simple illustration. Imagine that you traveled to another country, let's say Thailand. And you traveled to Thailand and you were there going on a vacation with your family or your friends or whatever. And you, you got off the plane and you were immediately arrested. And you were like, what, what's this about? What's this about? Uh, get in here. And they're speaking Thai to you, and they whisk you away to a Thai jail, and you spend the night there, and you're just, you thought you'd be you know, sipping a coconut drink on the Thai beach, and now you're stuck in a Thai jail. And uh, within a few days, you're arraigned before a Thai court, and uh, they're speaking a language that you don't understand. But finally, they begin to speak English, and, and you find out that you're being charged with drug smuggling. Are there any drug smugglers here tonight? <laughs> just raise your hand, because we have some police officers outside who'd like to speak to you. Okay. So for our purposes here, we're going to say you're not actually a drug smuggler, which I'm sure is true of 100% of you. But just imagine that you're being charged with drug smuggling, and then the prosecution begins to make their case. And somebody that was supposed to look like you and dress similar to the way that you dressed and have your same initials, et cetera, et cetera, they had a tip that that person was going to show up and be smuggling drugs. And lo and behold, you show up, and you were in the wrong place at the wrong time. Now here's my question. Is there any amount of evidence that the prosecution could present that would persuade you that you really are a drug smuggler if you were innocent? I mean, that would be a tough sell, wouldn't it? I mean, can you imagine yourself sitting there in the courtroom thinking, you know, that's a good piece of evidence. He might be right. <laughs> no, at no point would you ever yourself become persuaded, and here's why. Because you know internally, despite all external evidences in this case, you know internally and, and in, in, 
in, um, intuitively that you are not a drug smuggler, right? It's something that you know that you may not be able to adequately show. Do you hear the difference? There is a difference, and I think that's my next slide here. There is a difference between knowing something is true and showing it is true. You might know that you love chocolate chip cookies, but you could not show it to someone else's absolute satisfaction if they insisted on skepticism. You might know that you like bananas, but you could not prove to others that you liked bananas because they can't taste what's happening in your mouth. They can't feel the experience that you are experiencing when you eat the banana. And if someone was absolutely insistent on skepticism about your liking bananas or cookies or even your innocence as a drug smuggler, what could you do to prove it? Well, possibly in the case of the drug smuggler, you could marshal evidence that would prove that you were not. But in the cases of the banana and the chocolate chip cookies, you would be stuck. You would just have to say, well, look, I'm telling you the truth and you can believe it or not. But I know it's true. Listen carefully now. Even if I can't show you it's true to your perfect satisfaction. Do you hear the difference? I know it's true even if I can't show it to you to your absolute satisfaction. And believe it or not, belief Actually, not just belief in God, but knowing God is exactly like that. I'm going to tonight do a couple things. I'm going to present to you some really good evidence why you should believe that there is a God. But there is a chasm. I mean a huge chasm. A chasm like just imagine there's a cliff face here and there's a cliff face there. And there's a great yawning Grand Canyon deep chasm between. The difference between believing that there is probably a God and knowing for certain there's a God is a huge chasm, a huge leap, actually. And that's actually the appropriate language we're going to see a little bit later. A leap. And many people can come right up to the edge and say, well, I, the evidence does seem to point in that direction, and I really do think that there probably is a God. What I want to show you tonight is that there is really good evidence for this, by the way. We'll spend some time on that. But I also want to talk about how can you go from merely believing corroborating evidence and actually knowing in the same way that you know you like bananas or chocolate chip cookies, how can you know that there is a God? And do you know what the Bible says? This is very interesting. The Bible says, John chapter 8, verse 32, Jesus was speaking and he said, you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Jesus said that the way that we would come to know know, not just believe, but know that he is the Messiah, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, is a very interesting way. He said you would know it by the Spirit. Let me read that to you in John chapter 14. Jesus is speaking. He says in verse 16, John chapter 14, verse 16, I will pray to the Father and he will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Now, this is getting back to the, the triune nature of God that we talked about in the beginning, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Listen to this. I will pray to the Father. There's one, two, and he will give you another helper. Three, one, two, three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He will give you another helper that he may abide with you forever. Now, listen to this, verse 17. The Spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive, the unbelieving world cannot receive. Why? Because it does not see him. Or know him. Notice it doesn't say because they don't believe, but because they don't see, they use that as an excuse. If I can't see it, I don't know it. But watch what he says here. But you know him. Not you believe him. You know him. Well, how? How do I know him? Because he dwells with you and will be in you. Now, this is a remarkable thing that Jesus is saying here. Jesus is saying, you will know that I am the Messiah. You will know that I have not left you an orphan. You will know that I am with you because I will send the Holy Spirit. And in another place, he says, it will actually be for your benefit that I go away. Because the Spirit who, again, unlike Jesus, who was bound by time and space in his incarnation, if he was in Galilee, he had to walk to Jerusalem. If he was in Jerusalem, he had to walk to Bethany, etc. Bound by time and space. On one occasion, he said to his disciples, it's for your best interest, it's for your your benefit that I go away. Well, why so? How could it possibly be in our best interest that our teacher would leave us? He said, because when I go, I'll send you the Spirit. And the Spirit will transcend time and space such as I do because I'm bound by my physical human form here in the incarnation. But He will be with you. But He went even a step further. He'll be with you. He'll be around you. He'll be proximate to you. He said, He'll be in you. The Spirit will be in you and you will know. You will know. 
You will know the truth and you will be set free by it. And the New Testament picks up on this in place after place after place after place after place. Let me share with you another one. Paul is writing in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 8. This is one of my favorite passages in all of the Bible, Romans 8. And um, I, just, I just love it. I just cannot stay away from the book of Romans, and I just cannot stay away from Romans 8. Romans 8 is the climax of Paul's arguments and, and his line of reasoning in, Romans, in the book of Romans. But I just want to take one thing here, very interesting. Romans chapter 8. Verse 14, he says, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. There's that familial language again. If you're led by the Spirit, you are God's sons. Verse 15, For you did not receive the spirit of bondage or slavery. Remember, that's what Jesus just said. If you, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So he says here, You didn't receive the spirit of slavery again to fear, but you received, listen to this, the spirit of adoption. Is anybody else in this room adopted? Anybody adopted? I'm adopted. Am I the only adopted person in this room, really? Like, you're adopted by your parents? Wow, that is a statistical anomaly. I mean, there are several, there's probably like 200 people here, and I'm the only adopted person. That's really unusual. Okay. All right. I just suddenly want to change the whole presentation and just figure out what the odds of that are, but we're gonna, not going to do that. Um, now, listen to this. The spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. Now, m don't miss this. Here's what Paul is saying. Let me make it simple for you. Paul says, you received not the spirit of slavery. You received the spirit of Christ. And when the spirit of Christ comes into your life, the spirit of Christ calls out to God from within you, Dad, Father, Abba. And then he says in the very next verse, this is awesome, verse 16, the spirit himself bears witness with your spirit and you know that you are a child of God. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Now, don't miss Paul's line of reasoning here. It's exactly Jesus' line of reasoning. What he's saying is that God sends his spirit into your life. And when you receive the spirit, when you accept Jesus as your personal savior, when you receive Jesus as the faithful Messiah, he sends his spirit into your life. When the spirit comes into your life, the spirit cries out on your behalf and says, God, you're my dad. You're my father and I am your son. I am your daughter, and Paul says the Spirit himself bears witness, resonates with your spirit, so that you know you are God's son and God's daughter. Now, don't miss that. Many of us think, if, and I ask Christians all the time, I say, how do you know that there's a God? They say, well, the Bible is true, or the prophecies, or whatever. No, 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 no. The truthfulness of Scripture and the beauty of the prophecies and even some of the scientific evidences that we're going to look at here in a moment, all of those are evidences that show that you're likely right if all we had to go on was external evidence. But that's not what the New Testament says. The New Testament doesn't say that you know that God is your Father, that you know that there is a God on the, on the basis of some external evidence. No, it says that you know that you're a child of God because God has witnessed to you Himself by His Spirit. God has told you, you are my son, you are my daughter. The self-disclosure of God's own nature to you, you know it, even if you're really bad at telling others. Even if you don't know, I don't, I don't know the evidences, scientific, theological, philosophical, or biblical, I, I don't know, but I know that I know. In fact, there are some great passages, just I'll take you to a couple more quickly here in the book of 1 John, and then I want to get into some of the... Uh, uh, the reasons that we, tr the ways that we try and show it. Check this out. First John chapter 2 and verse 20. Paul, John says some really strange sounding stuff here, frankly. First John chapter 2 verse 20, he says, But you have an anointing from the Holy One. That's the Holy Spirit. He says, You have an anointing from the Holy One. You have the Holy Spirit, and you know all things. Now, when John says here that you know all things, he's not saying you know everything about geography, you know everything about topology, you know everything about anthropology and marine biology. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying you're suddenly an Encyclopedia Britannica. What he's saying is, is you know all things relative to your relationship with God through Christ. You don't need a pastor to tell you that. You don't need a priest to tell you that. You don't need a, a, an apostle to come and tell you that. You know it in your soul. You know that you are God's son. You are God's daughter. Look at verse 27. Verse, 1 John chapter 2, verse 27. But the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. And you do not need that anyone teaches you. You don't need David Asher to come and tell you that. John is saying, you don't even need me to tell you that. Look at this. But as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, just as it is taught you, you will abide in him. Translation, 
God himself has taught you by his spirit. God has revealed himself to you in the person of his spirit. And that's no. He says, you don't need anyone to teach you. Not even me, by extension. We'll stay in, chap we'll stay in 1 John. Go to chapter 3, verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. Notice the language. And by this we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given. Hey, John, how do I know? How do I know that I'm a son of God? How do I know that I'm a daughter of God? John would say, because he's given you his spirit. His spirit, now to use the language of Paul, his spirit bears witness with your spirit and tells you you're God's son, you're God's daughter. You know it because God has revealed himself to you. We'll go to chapter 4, look at verse 13. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us. How? Because he has given us of his spirit. And then my personal favorite, chapter 5. This is great stuff. We'll just read a quick section here. Verse 6. This is he, speaking of Jesus, who came by water and by blood. Jesus Christ. Not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. There are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three agree as one. Now, if you got a little confused in there, don't worry about it. Look especially at verses 9 and 10. If we receive the, witnesses of, uh, w the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of which God has testified of his son. What he's basically saying here is, if you believe what a human being tells you, you should believe what God is telling you. Right? And by the way, we, all, we often believe what human beings tell us. If a, if a human being says to us, oh, this is a great dessert, you need to get this. This is really good. You're at a restaurant, you need to order this dessert. You believe them. If I say to you, oh, there's a really good book, you really should read this book. We often will believe it. Right? If you say, oh, the way you get to my house is take the next right. You don't say, well, prove it. <laughs> prove it. I know you're telling me the truth. No, what John is saying is, as a general rule, when people tell us something, if we, if we find them to be respectable or believable people, we accept what they're saying. So what he says here is, if you will believe what people say, then believe what God is saying to you. And now look at verse 10. Boom! This is the punchline. He who believes in the Son of God. Do you have your Bibles open? If you, if you can see this. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness. What are the next two words in your Bible? That is an amazing thing. He who believes in the Son of God has the witness in himself. Now watch this. He who does not believe God has made God a liar because he has not believed the testimony that God has given of his Son. I want you to hear what John says over and over again, and I wish I had time to spend a whole time on 1 John. But he says, you don't need anyone to teach you. You know because God has given you an anointing, the Spirit. You know that you have a relationship with God because of the Spirit. You know because you have the Spirit. You know because you have the Spirit. And here he says, you don't need a man to teach you this. God himself has taught you this. You have the witness, not external to yourself. He says you have the witness in yourself. So the resounding teaching of the New Testament, and if time allowed, I could show you another 10 verses. The resounding teaching of the New Testament is that we know we are God's sons and daughters because God has sent his spirit into our hearts and God's spirit cries from within us back to him, Dad, Father. Now that's how we know it. What I want to spend some time now showing you is, or is spending time with you on now, is how do we show it? Is there any good external evidence or is it only this Oh, la, 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 la. sound of music experience in my heart. Is there some good external reasons for believing that there is a God? And I'm going to give you four good reasons tonight to believe that there's a God externally. Notice I didn't say four good reasons to know that there's a God. You know it by His Spirit. But you show it by evidence. Right? External evidences. And I want to give you four good reasons tonight and they can be summarized each in a single word. Time, life, mind, ought. Time, life, mind, ought. We're just going to literally race through these. The first one is the idea of time. And uh, Stephen Hawking, theoretical physicist and author who holds the Sir Isaac Newton Chair of Mathematics at Cambridge University, has famously said, almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, never mind the point about the Big Bang there, whether you believe it or not is beside the point. What Hawking is saying is spot on. He said, time, like the universe, had a beginning. Time had a what, everyone? Time had a beginning. Now, notice this next quotation here. This is from uh, Dr. Owen Gingrich, Senior Astronomer Emeritus at Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Look at what he says. Time as we know it and understand it, that is consisting of the before and after sequence. That happened before, this happened after. Time as we know it belongs to what? To our universe, 
Before the beginning, there was no time. There was no when then. Right? And fascinatingly, this is exactly how Scripture begins. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Scripture begins with the beginning. Now, now you might be thinking, well, well, what's the point here? This is an awesome point. Prior to sort of, the, sort of the modern understanding of the, the universe and its apparent expansion, notice I say apparent expansion, the idea in most cosmological and astrophysical circles was that the universe was eternal, that it always had been. You might uh, remember the, who was it that did the Cosmos series? Um, Carl Sagan, Carl Sagan, the universe he intoned is all that is or was or ever will be or something like that. Basically the idea that the universe, like God, supposedly, he of course didn't believe in God, but it possessed some kind of eternality. The universe always had been there, always will be there, right? But actually vir virtually no cosmologist or astrophysicist believes that today. What, what Hawking just said there a moment ago is basically everyone now believes that the universe had a beginning, right? And there are very good mathematical and, and there are very good mathematical, philosophical, and scientific reasons for believing that the universe had a beginning. The first is what Hawking describes as the Big Bang, and basically what that means is that when uh, and I don't have time to get into the cosmic microwave background radiation and all of that that led them to these conclusions. But the short version is is that when cosmologists and others, particularly after the advent of some modern amazing teles telescopes, they began to see that the universe appeared to be expanding, that, that everything seemed to be moving away, and they saw a shift in the stars, what's called the red shift. And uh, they believed that was because the stars were moving and they were shifting in the spectrum in the same way that a, a police siren, you know, if a police siren is just sitting right there and it's going, dee -doo, dee -doo, dee -doo, dee -doo. but if the, police, if the police car is driving, it sound, it, the sound bends. Dee -doo, dee -doo, dee -doo, dee -doo, dee -doo. Right? Even if you didn't see the police car, if you just heard a police siren that was still and a police siren that was moving, you could discern and say one of those is moving. Or at least it sounds like it's moving. Make sense? Well, in an analogous way, astronomers and others began to look at the stars and they saw what looked to be the telltale signs of movement. And it seemed like everything was moving and shoo, moving away at fantastic speeds away from some kind of a hypothetical center. And uh, that being the case, they began to, to, to postulate, this would be in like the 40s and 50s, that the universe, in fact, was expanding. Well, lots of people resisted this idea. They said, how can the universe possibly be expanding? It's eternal. It's always been here. I mean, how can anything be expanding into something? If the universe is infinite and eternal, what could it be expanding into and from what? And slowly, the astronomers and others began to say, you know what, maybe our fundamental assumption was wrong. Maybe the universe did, in fact, have a beginning. And this shift, tectonic shift in thinking about the nature of the universe over the last 50 years has basically led virtually all astronomers and cosmologists, at least mainstream, to say that the universe had a beginning, which was Hawking's point just a moment ago. Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning. Now... For my purposes, I'm not particularly interested in the science. Actually, I do find it quite fascinating. But my point is this. Modern science is saying the universe had a beginning in time. And scripture says the universe had a beginning in time. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And here we have a remarkable consistency between what modern science is telling us. In fact, very interesting. The man who won the Nobel Prize for his discovery of the cosmic microwave background radiation, a man by the name of um, Arno, Arnold Penzias, uh, he actually said, if all that we knew about the universe, if all we had to go on was the books of Moses and the Psalms and basically the Bible in general, if that's all that we knew, he said, the predictions that we would make about the nature of the universe are exactly what we see, right? That the universe had a beginning in time. Well, there's actually a very good mathematical reason to believe that the universe had a beginning, and it goes like this. By the way, if you can't follow this and your brain starts to hurt, don't worry. Here we are today, whatever the day is today. My birthday was just recently, so we'll say August 16th, August 16th. So if, if you're on August 16th, right, how many moments or days, whatever you can say, moments, days, months, years, decades, doesn't matter. We'll just say days. How many days were there before August 16th, 2013? How many days were there? Well, the answer is nobody knows. But what we do know is that 
there could not have been an infinite number of days before August 16th, 2013. Now just let that sink in. There could not have been an infinite number of days before, say, today. Well, how do we know there couldn't have been an infinite number of days before today? Simple. An infinite number of anything cannot be traversed. An infinite number of anything cannot be counted, right? Because, I mean, you would just keep going. You go back, back, we'll rewind the tape. And we think we're at the beginning, but no, we're just getting started. And we've gone back, say, millions and billions and trillions and quadrillions of days. No, we're just getting started. The point is, there could not have been an infinite number of days before today, or we could have never passed through that infinite number of days to arrive at today. So the only way that we could have ever arrived at today, moving through time, is if there was some beginning from which the sequence could start, commence, and lead us through, however many of days that is, or moments, or years, or decades, whatever you want to divide time up into. That number of days had to be finite to get us to today. And so there's a very good mathematical, philosophical, and scientific reason for saying the universe had a beginning. And this squares exactly with what Scripture says. In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. Boom! That's a very good reason to believe that there is a God. If there was a beginning, it stands to reason that there was a beginner. And just a quick word on that. The beginner could not himself be a product of the process that he began. There had to be some thing that that was not itself explicable by the process that actually began the process, that, that... caused the thing to begin to go. And uh, this is actually very quickly and easily illustrated, or at least said, and I'll just quickly say it for you. It works on three three simple lines. Number one, the universe... Number one, everything that begins to exist has a cause. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. Piece of cake. Number two, the universe began to exist. Okay, that's what modern cosmologists and physicists and others are saying, so we'll concede that. So number three actually follows logically, somewhat logically from this. The universe, therefore, had a cause, and that cause must be an uncaused cause of all subsequent causes. (laughs) By the way, do you know what you call the uncaused cause of all subsequent causes? Do you know what you call that? You call that God. That's exactly right. That's the thing that got the whole thing going. And so, there's very, very good reasons to believe that, in fact, there is a God based on just the nature of time and the nature of the universe. But there's even more good reasons to believe that there is a God based on the nature of life. The nature of life. And I'm actually reading another book right now. It's a fascinating book, highly recommended by Stephen C. Highly recommended by Stephen C. Meyer called Darwin's Doubt. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Charles Darwin tomorrow night. Maybe not in the way that you would think, though. Um, But basically, the point in Meyer's book is that modern biology is, is clearly communicating to us that there was an information explosion at some point in biological development, even for people that believe in long ages evolution, which I don't believe in. But even for people who believe, whether they believe in a short chronology or a long chronology, there was some kind of an information explosion, a whole lot of data, a whole lot of information suddenly shows up in the fossil record. In the case of Darwin's Doubt, it begins at the Cambrian explosion. And basically, boom, all of these animal forms and body plans just show up. But it takes a lot of data to make a trilobite. It takes a lot of data to make a human being or a monkey or a crab or a mollusk or a nautilus. It takes a lot of information. And here's an interesting thing. The only known source of information, listen very carefully, the only known source of information is intelligence. Okay? That's where we get information from, is intelligent sources. Right? And so if we have information, we have apparently, access to intelligence. In fact, Francis Crick, who was a co-discoverer of the DNA molecule, um, in 19... uh, He won the Nobel Prize in 1962 for it. He said this, An honest man, or woman, armed with all the knowledge available to us now, could only state that in some sense, the origin of life appears at the moment to be almost a... What does he say? A miracle. Now, remember, he's not saying this from a religious standpoint. He's saying this from a scientific standpoint. He appears to be almost a miracle... So many are the conditions that would have had to have been satisfied to get it going. 
Okay, so basically here's what happened. How many of us remember from high school um, the picture of DNA, the sort of spiral staircase? Okay, very good. And we think, oh, well, that's interesting. Look at how complex that is. But the complexity is not in the chassis, in the physical helix, uh, the double helix structure of the DNA. The complexity was in the four nucleotide bases that make up what can only be described as a chemical language. Now, just let that sink in. It's a language. It's a code. Whenever we encounter a language, whether it's the language of Japanese or Chinese or the language of music or, or Turkish or Arabic, when we see a language and then we see a language coded by symbols, we know we're dealing with intelligence. And so what Crick is saying here is, man, when we discovered that the building blocks of life were not just like little globules of goo, right, just like building blocks of little bricks, which is basically what Darwin thought in his day because they didn't have access to the, to the kinds of microscopic technology that we have today. They just kind of looked at it and said, well, that just looks like a brick. We now know that the simplest human cell is as complex or more complex than the, the factory that, man, that made your car. The factory that made your car is very likely less complex than the skin cells that are coming off of you when you just scrape the internal machinery and tech, nanotechnology that's in a single cell is fantastic. And back in the day when they just had these big clumsy microscopes, they had no idea. But as technology came along, they began to, whoa, whoa, whoa. And then when DNA was seen, not just to be an interesting, twisty, little snake-like molecule, but there was a code. There was, there was a language in there. Well, the only known source of intelligence and language and codes and symbols or the only known source of information and codes and language and symbols is intelligence. Now, this very information actually led uh, one of the world's foremost academic atheists, a man by the name of Anthony Flew, who spent the better part of his academic life as an atheist, an academic uh, philosophical atheist. Um, he changed his mind in 2001. He changed his mind and said, you know what, there is a God. In fact, you can read that book. It's a very interesting book. It's called There Is a God, How the World's Most Notorious Atheist Changed His Mind. And the, the, the evidence that caused Anthony Flew to change his mind was this. Let's read what he says. What I think the DNA material has done is show that... What's that next word? Intelligence must have been involved in getting these extraordinarily diverse elements together. The enormous complexity by which the results were achieved looked to me like the work of intelligence. See, what he's saying is, we've got information here. We've got data here. We've got a language here. How else do we explain that except by intelligence? And so there is very, very good reasons to believe, just from the biological world, and there are a great number of biologists today that are arguing strongly, not the majority yet, not even close to a majority, but there are a number of biologists and other scientists who are saying this looks suspiciously like the work of intelligence. Suspiciously like the work of intelligence. And so there's very good reasons when we look at the nature of life. My personal favorite is the nature of the mind. And this is a particularly fascinating one. Albert Einstein said several quotations that were very similar to this, but, but this is uh, my personal favorite. He said, the eternal mystery of the world is its comprehensibility. The fact that the world is comprehensible is a miracle. Now, let me just explain to you what he's saying here. The world with all of its math and all of its physics and its, its fine-tunedness within the solar system, within the larger cosmos, within the periodic table of, of elements and a hundred other scientific things that we have discovered. By the way, scientific truths are not made up. They're discovered. He basically says, okay, this is what, he, let me just give a paraphrase of what Einstein's saying here. Uh, and I'm no Einstein, by the way. Um, if the highest life form that existed on planet Earth was a goldfish... And everything else was exactly the same as it is. We would still have a marvelously complex, amazing, sophisticated world, both at the macro and the micro levels. But here's the interesting thing. The goldfish wouldn't appreciate it. The goldfish would not look longingly at a sunset and think about the meaning of life. Right? The goldfish would not look as Galileo did into the stars and figure out, wait a minute, we don't have a, a geocentric solar system, but a heliocentric solar system. The point, what Einstein is saying here, you know, this is a really interesting mystery. Not only is the universe fantastically well-ordered and complex, but there are brains here and minds that are able to apprehend it and be aware of it. Let that sink in. He, in, in the words of C.S. Lewis, surely this ought to raise our suspicions. Right? Not only is the world amazing, but there are minds here to appreciate that the world is amazing. 
And that's what he says. This is the eternal mystery of the world. The fact that it's at all comprehensible. That it's understandable. That the language of math and of physics is precisely tailored to give us information about the external world. And that there are minds here to do it. He says, it's a miracle. Surely, it ought to raise our suspicions. Of course, for the Bible believer, it's, it's exactly the case that it is a miracle. But the reason is, is that God made the earth to be inhabited. And he created Adam and Eve and their descendants with minds, with volition, with intellect, with will to be able to think about the world around them, to be able to make scientific inquiry and discoveries. It makes sense for us, but for the atheist who says, oh, it's just by chance. It is the luckiest conceivable coincidence. Number one, that there's a well-ordered universe at all. And number two, that there are minds here capable of apprehending just how well-ordered it is. What a happy coincidence. No, 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 no. It defies mere coincidence. And that's Einstein's point. He says, it's an eternal mystery. Another person who uh, agrees with Einstein on this, and this is back to Dr. Owen Gingrich, the senior emeritus astronomer at the uh, uh, Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, who, by the way, is himself a Christian. And he's a Christian in no small part. I've read his book, God's Universe. In no small part because he says, not based on my faith in a book or my belief in a God, he says, but based on my science. My science has led me to believe that the best explanation for the universe that we live in is a God. That's what he says here. To me, belief in a final cause, a creator God, gives a coherent understanding of why the universe seems so congenially designed for the existence of intelligent, self-reflective life. Notice, not just goldfish life, not just earthworm life, but intelligent, self-reflective life. Life that can sit out under the stars and think about, wow, oh, those are amazing stars. What am I doing here? What's my purpose? Right? Goldfish don't do that. Earthworms don't do that. What, what Gingrich is saying is the same thing that Einstein's saying. It, it, the, best explanation that, that the best explanation for why the world seems so congenially designed for the existence of self-reflective and intelligent life is a creator God. He says it would take only small changes in numerous physical constants to render the universe uninhabitable. In other words, he says, if the universe was only slightly different only slightly different, no one would live in the universe at all, much less intelligent minds that are able to apprehend the universe. Are you with me on that? And so I say it again here in the words of C.S. Lewis, surely this ought to raise our suspicions. We just happen to have minds capable of grasping the kind of universe in which we live, and we just happen to have the ability to formulate language, both the language that we speak, but also the language of math and physics to make sense out of the universe? Oh, come on. It screams intentionality. It screams design, and it screams purpose. But all of this does not prove there's a God. At very best, somebody could say, oh, that's interesting. Or somebody could say, yeah, I, I, I think that probably, probably the best explanation. In fact, if you just go back one, look at what he says here. To me, belief in a final cause is the best explanation, belief. But my point is, can we get beyond mere belief? Can we go from just good evidence, eh, it looks like pretty good, I'm going to go 96% sure there's a God. I'm going to go 96%. Or is there some way to go from belief based on evidence to knowledge based on experience? And the answer is yes. But the good news is, is that your, your experience with the Spirit, your experience with God is not just based on some, yeah, dream. No. There's very good, rock-solid, philosophical, mathematical, scientific reasons to believe that what you believe in your Spirit, what God has done by sending His Spirit, hey, this is true. This is actually true. So we have both the external corroboration. Now listen carefully. Believers have not only the external corroboration of some of these evidences, but we have the internal confirmation by God's Spirit. I want to say it again. Believers have not only external corroboration that point, yeah, that seems to point convincingly in the right direction. We have internal confirmation when He sends His Spirit into your life. And His Spirit comes in and says, you're God's son. You are God's daughter. Now, look at this one. This is a cool one. In 2000 and 2001, the computer scientists and programmers at IBM 
they tried a number of times, but they kept failing, 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 failing. They wanted to make a computer that could think quickly, quickly enough to beat the top chess champions at chess. And they failed and failed and failed and failed because chess is not merely a mathematical game, it's a creative game. It requires creativity, it requires strategy, it requires free uh, forward thinking. And, and the idea was, hey, we'll show how far along computers are coming, we'll make a computer that can beat the top chess masters in chess. And they tried it and they failed, they tried it and they failed, they tried it and they failed. Well, finally in 2000, 2000, 2001, they came up with a computer that they called Deep Blue because I think the first one was called Big Blue. And uh, this was actually at the time 36 supercomputers that were all linked together in an enormous thing, like the size of these boxes are bigger. And it took on Garry Kasparov, who was at the time the grand champion of chess in the world. And uh, before the, the big match was to take place to see if finally human beings could build a computer that could beat the chess champion of the world, um, David Gallertner, who was one of the programmers from Yale University who helped program the computer, did an interview, like a press conference, with, with many of the programmers. And the question was, man, this is really cool. We're getting better and better with our computer technology. It'll be just a matter of time before computers have minds like us. And Gallertner was like, er, stop right there. Never going to happen. Never going to happen. And this is what he said. Very interesting. The idea that Deep Blue, that's the computer, the idea that Deep Blue has a mind is absurd. Okay? How can an object that wants nothing, fears nothing, enjoys nothing, needs nothing, and cares about nothing have a mind? He continues. It can win at chess, but not because it wants to. It isn't happy when it wins or sad when it loses. And what are its plans after the match? If it beats Kasparov, is it hoping to take deep pink out for a night in the town? <laughs> right? It doesn't care about chess or anything else. It plays the game for the same reason that a calculator adds or a toaster toasts, because it was a machine designed for that purpose. Deep Blue is just a machine. It doesn't have a mind. That's the key word. It doesn't have a mind any more than a flower pot has a mind. Computers as we know them will never have minds, he says. No matter what amazing feats they will perform, inside they will always be the same, absolute zero. Now don't miss the point that he's making here. What he's saying is, is that what makes a mind special, what makes a mind a mind is its sense of I. Its sense of identity, its wants, its dreams, its hopes, its ambitions. A computer can be made, by the way, a computer is made by a lot of other minds putting information into it. Which gets, gets us back to the point I was making earlier. That the only known source of information is intelligence. Okay? But what Gallertner is saying here is that a computer will never have an I, a me, a sense of self in the wider world and in the wider universe that will apprehend dreams and hopes and desires and falling in love. He says, no, no, they're just machines. We program them. They can do some really cool, really sophisticated, really amazing things. And then he, even on a, 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 later in the article, he actually goes on to say, if, if human beings ever could invent a machine, all it would be would be an exact replica of our brain, a machine that, was, that had an eye. Because the brain is so sophisticated, so complex, so fantastically amazing, it not only is a physical organ, it gives rise to a self-conscious state. To me, to David, a person who's in love, who has children, who has hopes and dreams and desires. And, and, and that's Einstein's point. Man, he says, surely this is an eternal mystery. Not only that the universe is amazing and complex, but that there are minds here capable of apprehending it and grasping it. So far, so good? Okay, so then the final one is ought. We talked about the nature of time. We talked about the nature of life. We talked about the nature of the mind and ought. Ought is a, is a word that comes with duty and responsibility. It suggests that you should do something. You ought to do that. Duty, responsibility, obligation. Notice this very interesting letter from uh, J uh, John Healy, former executive director for Amnesty International. He was writing a fundraising letter and he said... I am writing to you today because I think you share my profound belief that there are indeed some moral, what is that word? Absolutes. When it comes to torture, to government-sanctioned murder, to disappearances, there are no lesser evils. Notice this. These are outrages against all of us. What Healy is doing here is appealing to your sense of ought. 
your sense of human decency and human dignity. And he assumes, and I believe correctly, by the way, that everyone feels basically the same about certain moral absolutes. For example, I believe it is always wrong to torture children Always. I can't imagine a situation where it could be defensible or, or excusable or acceptable to torture a child. So for me, the torture of children is an absolute moral wrong under all circumstances and under all, circum and under all situations. But that's because I believe that a child is made in the image of God and it is, a moral, it is an immoral abomination both to the child and to the child's family and to the child's creator God to treat anyone in that way. By the way, I believe the same about adults, too. You follow me? See, I believe in moral absolutes because I believe in a God who invests every human being with transcendent potential and transcendent significance and meaning. If I was an atheist, all I could really say is, um, I don't think you should torture children. But if somebody else said, well, I think we should, we would be at an impasse. Because we have nothing higher or grander to appeal to. It would be your opinion versus my opinion. Your perspective versus mine. You say tomato, I say tomato. You say potato, I say potato. You say don't torture, I say you do. You know, what are you going to do? At the end of the day, it's your word versus my word. Right? But this idea of ought, that there really are things that both should and things that should not be done, strongly suggests that there is some moral bearing in the universe, that there is some moral requirement in the universe. These are not just mere opinions or preferences, they're principles. Fyodor Dostoevsky in his, bro in his The Brothers Karamazov said, if God does not exist, everything is permitted, and he's right. If there is no God, who, pray tell, could object and say, um, well, you, you, can't, you can't do this, or you, you can't do that, or you should do this, or you shouldn't do that? Who would say? So these evidences, time, life, mind, ought, bring us right to the edge of belief, right? Right to the edge of belief. And they can give us very good reasons for belief. But here's a fascinating thing. The Bible promises more than belief. There is more than external evidences that seem to point in the direction of a God. Can we do any better than Richard Dawkins and the New Atheist with their buses that say there probably isn't a God? Can we just say there probably is and then we just go on our merry way? They're 96% sure there isn't. We're 96% sure there is. No, 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 no. Because what God does is, is God trumps the whole conversation. What God does is he says, I'll bring you out of the realm of mere belief and evidence and external corroboration. God says, I'll send my spirit. My spirit will come into your heart and the spirit himself, to quote Paul again, will bear witness with your spirit. And you will know that you are my son. You will know that you are my daughter. So the, to answer, in answer to the question, does God exist? The answer is yes. And I want to tell you, you can know this for certain for yourself. By inviting God to give you his spirit, accepting Jesus as your personal savior and saying, God, reveal yourself to me. And then the external corroboration of the scientific evidences will become even greater because it will move from mere external corroboration to internal confirmation. When Jesus keeps his promise to you, he will be with you and will dwell in you.